This video will serve as a beginner crash course when assembling an off-grid solar power system. I know electricity is scary and it is absolutely dangerous, but if you follow some basic rules, you should never have any issue. And usually people make the same mistakes over and over again. So please check out this video if you're a beginner and let's get started. First, we're gonna learn how to crimp a large cable. You never wanna use solder and you need to use the proper tools. So first we need to strip this cable and this is a two watt gauge cable. So we're gonna use this right on top, spin it around and remove the insulation. Next, this is a two watt gauge lug and we put this on top of the conductors. And it should fit like this, it should be nice and snug. And then we're gonna use a crimper. We're not gonna use pliers, we're not gonna use a vise. We're gonna use a proper crimper and we're gonna set it to two watt gauge and then wiggle the crimp to ensure that it's strong Put some heat shrink on top. Also ensure that the hole is the proper size for the terminal that you're attaching it to. For example, if I'm attaching to this bus bar, it should fit like this without any extra space around the stud. Also, there should be no washers underneath. This needs to be flush and flat with the bus bar itself. Now you can have multiple lugs on a single stud, but you don't want to exceed three lugs. And typically, I don't like to exceed two. Also, never put a washer between these lugs. You want them flush and flat with the bus bar. Now when you make these connections, everything in the system should be turned off, but it's best practice to still tighten everything down with an insulated ratchet. Just in case you leave one of the batteries turned on, this will prevent a dead short. Next, the moment you work with a battery, whether it's on or off, you need to be wearing safety glasses. Next, whenever you work with a battery, you need to switch them all to the off position. Usually you'll have a breaker or you'll have an on and off switch. So for these ones, we have a switch. Next, use a voltmeter to ensure there is zero volts. Once you have verified there is zero volts, then you can start connecting batteries. And then after everything is connected, then you can turn the batteries on. Never turn these things on until everything is completed. Very important rule. Now this battery has a breaker so I can turn it off without turning off the BMS. This is totally fine to do. Just verify with the voltmeter that you have zero volts present. Now if you're connecting lots of large 48 volt batteries in parallel, you want to use a bus bar. And the server rack has bus bars built in. We have a negative and we have a positive bus bar. The batteries are attached to the bus bar with equal length conductor. And the conductor in this wire is large enough to trip the overcurrent protection in the battery. So everything you see here is very safe, but where it gets dangerous is when you connect multiple bus bars together. Let's say you have three server racks and you're trying to connect them together. This is where you want to use a T-class fuse, something like this. This is what I'm using to connect this server rack to the rest of my system. If there's something that goes Goes wrong, this will catch it. When you're working with large batteries, they can produce a lot of current and you need a high AIC rating to extinguish the DC arc that this can create. So the best way to do it is with the T-class fuse. Now, some batteries come with built-in bus bars. And if you use their included cables, like the EG4 Power Pro or the Ruxu Lithi 16, you don't need T-class fuses, but you have to use their cables and their connectors only. With these types of batteries, do not build your own cables. Use the ones that they designed for it. It works with this battery's overcurrent protection and the integrated bus bars. Don't use anything else. Next, before you take off any covers, ensure that everything is turned off, not just the battery. So if you have solar connected, turn that off. If there's an AC input, turn that off. And if there's a battery, turn that off. And again, verify with the voltmeter that everything is turned off. Then you can safely work with everything without any problems. Next, your system needs a PV disconnect. A lot of large inverters actually have it built in, like this one. So if you wanna disconnect the solar panels, you can switch it off like this. But some inverters do not have it, especially the budget-friendly ones, like this inverter right here. But luckily, you can add your own solar disconnect for $30 or $40. And if you're a beginner, you absolutely 
absolutely need to add this to your system. If you don't have a disconnect and you try to disconnect your solar array during the daytime, you can actually cause damage from the arcing inside of this connector. But with this, you can turn it off and then you can work on your solar array. So this is very crucial. Also, if you wanna work on your inverter, you wanna be able to shut down power from your solar array so there's no live voltage inside of this box when you're working on it. This is technically the most dangerous part of the system. This is high voltage DC. This is super dangerous. So make sure you always put this in before you connect any solar panels to your system. Something else you should do is check the voltage of your solar array before you connect it to your system. This has a maximum voltage input of 500 volts. But if you connect too many solar panels in series, you could create 600 volts. And if you attach it to this, it will be permanently destroyed. So check the voltage before you attach it. Also, the minimum voltage is very important as well. For most 48 volt systems, you want to have a 200 volt solar string. And with most solar panels today, that's going to be five or six solar panels, and that will give you the best performance. You might be able to wake up the system and get some current to flow with four panels, but for the best performance, you want five or six minimum. Now that this system is shut down, let's open up this cover and let me show you some more stuff. Now, after you're done building your system, you need to check every connection to ensure that it's tight. Loose connections can cause fires, they can melt terminals, they can mess with voltage sensing and all sorts of other issues. So wiggle every single connection to ensure that it is really tight. And this is one of the most important steps. This is like 90% of problems is caused by loose connections. So do this every time before you turn on a new system. Next, the worst battery failures I've ever seen is DIY raw cell systems. When you're designing a battery, everything needs to be perfect. There's lots of small stuff that matters a whole lot. So if you're a beginner or if it's your first system, just stick with the plug and play batteries and get one with a metal case. If something goes wrong, it will be contained in that metal box. It's really hard to catch things on fire if it's all contained in a metal box or conduit or a metal box like this for the wiring. Whenever you see your system, think, is there any wires, if they get hot, are they touching something that can combust? If you're next to a wooden wall, you do not want any wires touching that wall. Back in the day, this whole wall was covered with hardy board so that if something went wrong, it would not catch anything on fire. But now we have everything in these metal boxes. But sometimes we can't put everything in a metal box like these battery cables right here. So ensure that these are the proper size for the overcurrent protection that they're attached to. And this battery has a fuse, a DC rated circuit breaker, and a BMS with overcurrent protection. So if anything happened to these cables, it would trip one of those safety mechanisms but it wouldn't trip if these were undersized. If I was using a 10 gauge wire from this battery, this large terminal, and I caused a dead short next to a wooden board, it could catch on fire. Usually it's not the battery that causes the fires, it's what it's attached to and not using the proper size conductors for the overcurrent protection. If you have large batteries, you wanna connect it with the proper size conductor. And every time you're sizing a conductor, you wanna use a chart. The chart will tell you the thickness that you need for the current load that you're trying to run, and it will also tell you the temp rating of the insulation. Each wire has its own temp rating, and that will de also determine the current that it can handle. But there's something tricky about these charts because a lot of these wires have really high temp rated insulation, especially welding cable and THHN that is available at the local hardware store. Typically, these are rated for 90 degrees Celsius or higher. Some of them are rated for 200 degrees Celsius or higher. And when you look at the chart, you're gonna say, wow, this thing can handle a lot of current. But just because a wire can handle the current doesn't mean the thing that you're attaching to it actually can. The terminals that you're attaching it to or the circuit breaker also has its own temperature rating. And if it's rated for 70 or 80 degrees Celsius and you're connecting a 90 degrees Celsius rated temp insulation wire, you're gonna run into problems. This thing could actually melt even though the wire can handle the current. So when I size a conductor, I use the lowest temperature 
rating current capacity. It will give me a lower figure, but my system will run at a cooler temperature and it will be safer to use. Especially when wires are really short. When you look at that chart, you'll say, oh my gosh, this little couple inches can handle so much current, but that's not true. You need to ensure that everything can handle it. The terminal, the breaker, the insulation and the wire. Everything needs to handle that current, not just the wire itself. Next, before you turn anything on, you need to always check the polarity. So positive goes to positive negative goes to negative. Where people screw this up is with the MPPT. So the solar input, you need to ensure that the positive is going to positive and the negative is going to negative. Once the solar disconnect is properly installed and you have it looking like this, you can't screw up the connection. There's only one way to connect it. But if you don't connect this properly and these are directional, you can screw up your system. Also with the AC output, check that the hots are going to the hot, the neutrals going to the neutral, and the ground is going to the ground. Now, if you have a battery that you can't turn off, like small 12 volt batteries, you wanna connect everything to the system first or the inverter, and then connect the battery last. That should be the last step. Now, the last thing I wanna tell you guys is whenever you work on an electrical system, you should never be in danger. If you think about what you're doing and what you should do first and then last, you should never be exposed to something that can hurt you. You can always turn off electricity. And sometimes it's hard to figure this out, but just think about things for a second before you work on something. There's always a way to do it so that you're working on it safely. I hope you like this video and I hope it helps. Please leave a comment down below. And if you have any more questions, check out my forum. Lots of people there, including myself, that can help you. And if you follow these rules, you should be good to go. So I'll see you in the next video and thank you so much for watching. Bye.